Welcome back to chapter 5. In this second video from the chapter, we are going to be talking about spectroscopy in astronomy. So it's going to be our introduction to how astronomers are able to use the light received from stars to learn a whole lot more about stars than just if they're bright or dim. So the basis of what we care about in this particular section comes from the same experiment that we actually started the previous video with. The fact that Isaac Newton thought that light acted like a particle is because he was able to shine sunlight through a prism and see it disperse into the different colors that we think of as the rainbow. Now, what he then considered was that all of those red parts of the light were particles of red versus particles of yellow or violet. But it is still true, even though light is this photon, this wave and particle duality, it is still true that white light, especially when it comes from a incandescent light bulb or the sun, is made up of several different colors combined. And for situations where we do have a hot, dense object, and we'll be talking about that soon, it is all of the colors um, in a smooth, continuous spectrum. Now, when we are able to spread that light out to look at the rainbow, we can learn a whole lot if we look at that information in a couple of different ways. So we'll focus our upcoming discussion of stellar spectra, spectra is the plural of spectrum, on spectral curves and spectral lines. Spectral curves are sometimes known as black body curves, and so we'll be learning that term um, very soon. Black body radiation already came up once in our previous uh, video, and we'll be talking about it now. And spectral lines. And in the case of astronomy, we are either talking about absorption lines or emission lines. And by the end of this chapter, not necessarily this video, but also next video, we'll have a really solid understanding on where these spectral lines are coming from. Okay, so to get started on our discussion here, we actually have to take a step back from astronomy specifically and talk about a couple of terms that we may have encountered in a previous science class, middle school or high school, but I want to make sure that we're all on the same page uh, moving forward. So when we talk about heat in science, we are talking about a type of energy. An object is able to have heat energy. And it's the energy associated with the motion of atoms or molecules that make up an object, because there's a different type of energy if an object is overall moving, like a car driving down the road has kinetic energy. We're talking about down at the atomic level, the fact that the atoms and molecules are shaking around gives an object heat energy. When we take a temperature, either the temperature of the room we're in or the temperature of the oven when we're trying to cook, what we're actually talking about, the number value that we're talking about, is a way to describe the average speed of the atoms or molecules in an object or a gas. That motion is due to heat energy. The more heat energy an object has, the faster the atoms are going to be moving around. And if we think about turning the temperature up, let's say that we have a thermostat we have um, access to. If we turn the temperature up and make it hotter, what we are saying is that all of the atoms in the air around us are going to be moving around faster. But if we take that to the extreme the other way, we turn the thermostat down and way down and cool the air around us, we're saying that the atoms and molecules are going to move around slower. Now, something we don't have access to in our um, at-home thermostats, but that it is physically possible or theoretically possible is that if we turn the temperature down further and further and lose heat energy, we're moving slower and slower, at some point we reach a temperature where there is no motion, where there is no heat energy. That temperature is described as absolute zero. That's what that term means. But it is worth making sure we understand that that number value is not necessarily zero in different temperature scales. 
Fahrenheit is the temperature scale that we use most commonly in the United States. Water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. It boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Most sciences and the standard for the metric scale is Celsius or centigrade. And water freezes at zero degrees Celsius and it boils at 100 degrees Celsius. And then Kelvin is a scale that you may not have ever encountered in a previous um, situation in uh, K through 12 learning or outside in your everyday lives. But Kelvin is the scale that astronomers use. Degree for degree, one change from a um, value of two degrees Celsius to three degrees Celsius is the same as a degree change from 275 Kelvin to 276 Kelvin. The Kelvin scale is actually just the Celsius scale but shifted so that there are no negative numbers in the Kelvin scale. Zero Kelvin is by definition zero, absolute zero. It's equivalent to negative 273 degrees Celsius or negative 460 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and we won't have ever encountered absolute zero or anywhere close to it in our everyday lives, no matter how cold winter feels here in Michigan. Now, astronomers use the Kelvin scale because of such a wide range of temperatures that show up when we start talking about the coldness of space and the heat of the interiors of stars. And so we're going to be seeing these numbers in degrees Kelvin or in Kelvin quite often. In our study of the universe, we'll see a wide range of numbers ranging from 3 Kelvin, which is about the temperature of space uh, at this current um, era, and 10 to the 14 or 100 trillion Kelvin, which is how hot the universe was for a fraction of a second at its very beginning. Now, the really important part that we now have to add to our understanding, whether or not we had learned about heat energy before this class, what we now need to know is that dense objects, and we count as a dense object, we are solid, dense objects with temperatures above absolute zero create electromagnetic radiation. They create light, because as those atoms shake around and move, they bump into each other. That doesn't happen in the air around us enough to create the amount of electromagnetic radiation that we're talking about here. The atoms have to be all squished together in a solid rather than in a gas. But the glow that results from this dense object being hot is called blackbody radiation. If that object is hot enough, it won't just produce generic electromagnetic radiation, but it will actually produce enough and high enough energy light to glow in visible light. We will be able to see that object glowing. If you have ever had a um, stove with a metal burner instead of a gas stove, when you first turn the stove on, the metal burner doesn't look like it's glowing, but it is still hot. Eventually, when it reaches the temperatures that we need for boiling pasta, for example, it has reached a high enough temperature that it is now glowing in the visible, a kind of dull red or a bright orange color. We are talking about black body radiation in that context. It is also worth recognizing that we human beings are solid objects above absolute zero, and so we produce black body radiation. We produce infrared light. That's why we show up on infrared cameras like night vision or um, different uses like um, sinks in, in bathrooms. Oftentimes, at this point, sinks are not motion activated, but rather infrared sensitive. Uh, and there's lots of other everyday uses of it as well. Now, incandescent bulbs are black body emitters as well. When we think about incandescent bulbs, what we mean is a light bulb that has a little metal filament that is heated up through electricity so that that metal, which is a dense piece of metal, heats up enough to glow in the visible. It is a black body object. The reason why incandescent bulbs are so inefficient and why there's been a push for several um, years now to switch all of your light bulbs to LED bulbs is because incandescent bulbs, 
and a technology that relies on black body radiation means that we are producing a huge amount of infrared light. When we use the everyday word heat, we're typically talking about infrared light that we can detect by basically sensing it, um, the warmth. They're inefficient because most of the energy is in the infrared instead of the visible. So we're spending all of that money on our electricity bills basically in order to warm up the light bulb rather than glow um, and brighten our rooms. There's a video here that will be um, put into the um, playlist that shows how that brightness and color of the light bulb changes as we heat it up. It is a really useful video for us to watch and so I, I highly encourage you to make sure to watch that right after this video. Now, the important part is that black body radiation is still light. Black body radiation is describing a set of um, intensities per unit wavelength, but all of that radiation is light. It's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we have some curves shown here that represent four different hot objects, one that is at 3,000 Kelvin, at 4,000, at 5,000, and at 6,000 Kelvin. Now, any source of electromagnetic radiation that has the properties listed um, on the left would be a black body um, radiation source. If we look at all four of these examples, there is a peak intensity. In this particular picture, it's shown with a little purple dot. The location of that peak intensity left to right is based on the temperature of the object. In the textbook, there is an equation called Wien's Law, W-E-I-N, W-I-E-N, um, Wien's Law, that you can um, look up if you want to. I don't have it in the slides because we're not going to do calculations with it, but that peak wavelength only cares about the temperature. The overall structure of this curve has a really particular shape. We won't get into the mathematics to describe that shape. Mostly we just want to recognize that there is a peak and then it kind of tails off on either side. And it's worth noting that the total amount of energy radiated, the total amount of energy is based on the temperature as well, and it cares about temperature to the fourth power. If an object is twice as hot, then it will produce 16 times as much energy. So that's something that, although we won't do calculations with it, we do want to recognize that the temperature of stars are, is really going to change how we view those stars. And on that um, note, if a star has a really high temperature, it will produce more, red, more blue light than red light. So it will look overall blue. If we look in this example of four stars, although they're color-coded orange, yellow, green, and blue so we can talk about them easily, none of these four stars are hot enough to look blue to us. But there are stars that will look visibly blue uh, when we look at them through a telescope with our eyes because they're producing more blue light than red light. If a star has a temperature kind of in the middle of, um, that peaks kind of in the middle of the visible range, it's going to produce roughly equal amounts of blue and red, and so it will look yellowish, but that yellow is really going to be kind of washed out. It will look more of a white color. And then if a star has a really low temperature, like 3000 or 4000 Kelvin here, it will produce more red light than it does blue. The curve is higher on the red side than it is on the blue, and so it will look overall red in color. Throughout the course, we will be talking about stars and we will use the terms reddish and bluish to describe them. And the reason why we do that is because when we start to add colors together, we cannot actually get the full rainbow of colors. Like there aren't vibrant green stars out there. This is the set of colors that are available to us when we have that particular shape that comes from black body radiation. Red stars will look red, and we can talk about orange and yellowish white and bluish white stars, and really hot stars will actively look blue to us, but all of it's gonna be kind of a washed out color. So just something to keep in mind.
It's also worth noting that the sun is um, around 5,800 Kelvin. So if we look at this chart here, we would see that the sun is a kind of yellowish white, orangish white color. And although it looks yellow, if we um, look at it with our eyes, what we're seeing is that kind of orangish white color and how our eyes perceive that. Okay, a pause and think question for us. If we have a piece of metal that is heated to a high temperature, and we have a second piece of metal that is bigger, it's twice as large, but it's heated to a lower temperature, which of those two objects is going to appear redder? So read through the options. Pause the video to think through it. Okay. Now, although size will play a role in our eventual discussions of how overall bright an object is, the color is only based on temperature. And that's worth writing down in all capital letters, is that star color is based only on the surface temperature. So when we think about red and blue, although we have a lot of um, symbology in our everyday lives where blue is meant to look cold objects or red is meant to look like hot objects, we need to recognize that all throughout our course, red is the colder color because it is the lower energy color. A cold star, if we go back one slide, a cold star, a thousand or two thousand Kelvin, it will look red to us. Blue has the higher energy form of light, and so you can only produce a lot of blue light if you have a very hot star. So the answer here is option one, the cooler piece of metal appears redder. The size does not affect the color. The size will eventually affect the brightness, but we aren't going to talk about that in this particular video. Now, the other important thing that we now have to add is that real stars are not simple curves. They have dips where they're missing particular wavelengths of light, and all of that is going to be something that we build on in this chapter and in later chapters. This particular image here compares two different types of stars. We will learn about those spectral types in a later chapter. But for now, we can at least recognize that both of those um, lines drawn are not smooth curves. There's more going on here. And beneath them, there's a little rainbow shown with dark lines. Those are called spectral lines. And that's the next thing that we need to talk about in this section of the book. So a black body curve is a continuous spectrum, but there are three types of spectra. If we have a hot, high density energy source, like an incandescent light bulb, then we will produce a continuous spectrum. We will produce black body radiation. If we have a hot, low density gas cloud, so sodium lamps, um, uh, for street lamps or neon signs that say open and in restaurants, those low density gas clouds, they aren't producing black body radiation. They're not dense enough to do that, but they do produce light. They can glow and they will create what's called an emission spectrum. And we'll get into um, in this chapter why that happens. And then if we have a hot, high density energy source, like the core of a star, but it is surrounded by a cool, low density gas cloud, that cool, low density gas cloud is going to take away certain lines and produce an absorption spectrum like we saw on the previous slide. So this picture is really important for us to understand. It may be worth um, drawing out in your notes before you continue in the video. But it's also worth recognizing that these different types of spectra, they result from the way that we are viewing the light. It is possible for an overall structure, depending on where we are looking, if there's a gas cloud in the way, to see a continuous spectrum if we're looking directly at the hot dense source, like a filament light bulb, or like a yeah, incandescent light bulb. If there's a cloud of gas in the way, and we're not really talking about the air, um, it's not dense enough or um, uh, long enough to, to cause a big change. But if we're looking at a source of um, black body radiation through lower density gas clouds, 
we can see a change to the spectrum because that gas takes away um, specific wavelengths and we get a continuous spectrum with dark lines, that's an absorption spectrum. If, however, we're in a viewpoint where we don't see the background bright rainbow of colors, we only see the cloud of gas, as it is warmed up by um, or excited by taking all of these um, wavelengths away, it will re-emit them. It will send that light back out and create a bright line spectrum that we call an emission spectrum. Now, I want us to think about a couple of different circumstances, a couple of different situations that we might find in astronomy. There are clouds of interstellar gas called nebulae that we will be talking about later in the semester. If we analyzed the glow from a low-density object like one of these nebula, which type of spectrum do we expect to see? All right, so the key word here is low-density. And so a low-density cloud of gas cannot produce blackbody radiation. What we would see is a bright line emission spectrum, option two here. If we think about the sun, on the other hand, what of these three types of spectra would be produced by the sun? So think through the options. Okay, the graph here is showing in that orangish red color um, that we aren't seeing a smooth curve. This picture from our textbook might help as well. If we look, although we see a rainbow, it is not a perfectly smooth, continuous rainbow. We are missing certain wavelengths. We get an absorption spectrum from the sun and from all stars. So big capital letters in our notes, all stars produce absorption spectra. Now, if we just had this little rainbow picture here on the slide now, could we figure out the location of the peak wavelength? So the peak wavelength is based on the curve that we saw before, which is why spectral lines are a different piece of information than spectral curves. We cannot tell the location of the peak wavelength without having that smooth curve like we had before we got started here. The wavelength of that peak is somewhere around 500 or 600 for the sun if we look at it. Okay, so for this section, it was a tough section, it's one of the more important sections from the chapter. We now have talked about what black body radiation is. We've talked about the smooth curves that come from this type of um, hot, dense object, and that those smooth curves are a continuous spectrum, but there are two other types of spectra that exist. Stars form all of their light in their hot, dense cores, but have lower density outer layers that overall produce an absorption spectrum when we look at them. The spectral curve that up and down curve tells us about a star's temperature because the location of that peak, which will also tell us about the color, is based on the temperature. And then the spectral lines of a star are going to tell us what types of elements exist. That's what our focus of the next video is going to be, figuring out what those spectral lines are actually able to tell us now that we have words to describe absorption lines and emission lines. So I will see you in that next video.